Slidell Memorial Hospital. Your hospital for life. Hello and welcome to another edition of HealthQuest. St. Tammany's response to meeting the information needs of you, the citizens of our parish. My name is Bruce Clement. I am the executive producer and host of the show. It is a distinct privilege to be with you today. Also today, we're excited to introduce Dr. Mike Braxton. Dr. Braxton is an internal medicine board certified physician dual certified in PM and R, and we're going to let him tell us more about what that means. The focus of today's show is to talk about what we call a back and spine center. It's uh, a relatively new concept that is going to enhance outcomes for patients with back and spine issues. Dr. Braxton, thank you for joining us today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Now tell us, what encouraged you to go into medicine as you were growing up? Yeah, that's a, that's a long story. Um, <laughs> I, I was an athlete in, in school since the time I was eight. In fact, like the first football team I played on was the Saints, that's funny. But um, I had some injuries along the way and ended up in orthopedics office and things like that. So I just got interested in the, in the medical field just from interacting with various doctors along the way. I always had a strong interest in science in general. The only person in my family that could stand the sight of blood and you know so <laughs> you know i was kind of geared toward that so i think i'd probably around 12 years old i knew that's what i wanted to do so some direct experience some uh some hopefully minor injuries on on the on the football field at that time exactly. and then on to a high school college medical school was where uh, med school was medical college of virginia in, in richmond and I went to William and Mary before that for undergraduate. Fantastic. Played a little bit of ball there, got hurt, and had to give it up. <laughs> well, you you have direct experience on both sides of the equation here, don't you? Exactly. Yeah. Now, today you are the medical director of the Back and Spine Center of East St. Tammany in Slidell, Louisiana. Tell me about that role. Well, as, as a director, the patients come to me first, and... Um, my job is to do their initial evaluation and then determine what additional treatment is, is needed and get them in the right path. So we're working closely with interventional pain, with physical therapists, with neurosurgeons, and I'm the, kind of the gatekeeper in that role. All right, and we're gonna get in, in depth into how these different specialties fit and how they play together. So, uh, uh, what uh, you did your residency now we were talking earlier um, and we call it affectionately big charity that's right because at big charity you will see everything right and I did <laughs> I, saw, I saw everything yeah. so double boarded internal medicine and PM and R correct and what that means is a little more time right in the in the residency program it's a five year it was a five year program yeah, that's, yeah. A, that's a significant yeah. program well, we're delighted to have you and very lucky to have you as our medical director in this program. Well, thank you. Now, when we talk about uh, the, the major components of a back and spine center, take us through those. Uh, we have a nice slide here, very colorful. Right. And take us through some of the components. And it's, you mentioned earlier a comprehensive assessment. Correct. All right. So from there, where do we go? Yeah, so comprehensive assessment, you know, in medicine, we say that your assessment of the patients starts start as soon as you meet them, right? So you're, you're assessing how their, their demeanor, how their posture, do they look comfortable? Do they look uncomfortable? Do they look sick? Or do they look well? Are they telling you they've got 10 out of 10 pain, but they're laughing and joking? You know, you want to make sure that the patient's demeanor fits what they're, what they're telling you. Then you go on into the history, which is probably the most important aspect of of doing an assessment because a lot of times patients will just pretty much tell you what's what's going on with them and um, so then you have some directed questions of course and you're asking things about their general health and of course their pain complaints and in that is along with that comprehensive assessment we're doing a functional assessment because you want to know how is that pain affecting the patient's life how's it affecting their quality of life if we go back for a second to that comprehensive assessment, do you typically see patients that have tried different therapies and 
you know, maybe get get frustrated or, or get discouraged about you know where they are with their level of pain. It, uh, are they pretty much down that path when they come to see you that they've tried some things and it didn't work or it didn't work as effectively as they wanted it to? Yeah, I would say I'd say some some of them are. I, you know, I do get some patients that this is a new occurrence for them. They haven't had back pain before, and we're doing we're working them up from the ground up. But there's a fair number that come to you that have already had you know, some degree of assessment already either through their primary care physician or you know other providers that come from out of state. Any of those things. Would so, so you do get an opportunity, and we're going to talk more about that, about you do see some acute onset, and then you do see some chronic onset. Exactly. That's good. And a functional assessment for those of us who've never had that. What is that? Functional assessment is basically just how the pain is, is affecting your quality of life, keeping you from doing the things that you really want to do, whether that's fishing, hunting, or golfing, or whatever, whatever it is. So you ask those questions, how it's, it's more of a question than an, an actual procedure. So that you don't, you're not on a machine at that point doing... Not at that point. Checking no. range of motion and doing... Not is, at that point. It's more of a, a conversation. Still conversation, still trying to dig in to find out, you know, how does this person function in everyday life? Exactly. All right. And then what happens next? You see some second opinions coming in or... Sometimes we get second opinions. You know, most of the time... I'll try to manage patients with medications, and then I'll send them to physical therapy, usually. Um, in some cases, I do need a second opinion right away, and that's a good thing about the program is that I'll have interventional pain management there. I'll have a neurosurgeon there where I can just go walk right across the hall and, and ask for another opinion, and that's, uh, that's very useful to, to have. And I think you've hit upon the key of what makes this program so effective and so important in that you as a physician have literally direct contact with your colleagues to say, I need you to look at this, exactly. or would you look at this? This is what I see, can you look at this? And so we're all within a same, like the same center, the same, and it's a physical location, isn't it? That's correct, yeah. Because when you have, uh, remote locations or disparate locations where maybe different cities even um, that makes it more difficult for patient compliance exactly it does that and it also it gets opportunities to have breaks in in care right if I can just walk across the hall you know I know that that communication is, is taking place with that surgeon or with the interventional pain and patients like that too if I can say well hold on a second I'm just gonna walk across the hall and talk to the interventional pain doctor and see what we can do. And I'm back in the room in 30 seconds saying, well, this is what we can do to, to help you. So, so when you go, like, let's just say it's interventional pain physician, and uh, we have Dr. Vu, who's a very widely respected and yes. ver a very busy physician. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. We, uh, you go over and talk to Dr. Vu and say, hey, Dr. Vu, I've got this patient. And he'll say, well, I can see him next week, or I can see him today or tomorrow. Exactly. Because exactly. he'll have to work them up too, right? Or he'll have to at least continue. Exactly. Most of the time when I, when I refer to interventional pain, I've done the work up myself, and I've already just determined what I think they need, to, they need to have done from an interventional pain standpoint. So most of the time, the patients don't need to actually be evaluated by him. They can just go straight to procedure from, from there. And that you have hit upon what I feel is one of the most important components of this consolidated center is that he's there, you did the workup, you know what needs to be done. Dr. Vu, this, what, this is what needs to be done. And then he can, he can say, okay, I can see him tomorrow, next week, or you know, exactly. to, and to, to, to get whatever their therapy is going to be. Streamlines the, the care, right? yeah. and that, that saves money, saves the patient time and effort, and we get things done efficiently. It's the same with the, the neurosurgeon. Most of the time, you do still have to send them for the surgeon to actually do an evaluation if you have to If you have to get to it that, goes point. that point. Yeah. If it gets to that point. But still, a lot of patients don't That's ever right. need to go that, That's right. that route. And, and, and we're going to talk to a very accomplished neurosurgeon uh, later right. uh, to, to talk about how, how his role ties in. And I think you, meant, you mentioned it um, where the connection is very, very understandable at that point. Yeah. Now, physical therapy. 
Uh, you know, physical therapy is uh, for the layperson, which I consider myself, even though I have a little teeny bit of medical knowledge. Right. Um, when you go to physical therapy, if you're already hurting, uh, I think a great fear that people have is they're going to hurt me more. Right, right, yeah, <laughs> I get that. How do, you, how do you dissuade or how do you encourage people to say, look, it may hurt a little bit, but then you're going to... That's exactly right. That's exactly <laughs> what you say. You, you say, look, the treatment for, for back pain, neck pain, spine disorders is an active treatment. It's not like having an upper respiratory infection and you can passively take antibiotics and get better. This is something where you have to be actively involved in your, in your treatment. So kind of means taking a little bit of discomfort to get ultimately better because I think if you recognize the syndrome, the pain syndrome that the patient has and you get them, you get a therapist who's on the same page with you, then they should get better with, with directed, directed treatment. So. And, and I, you know, from personal experience, and I know, you know, thousands of people, millions probably have this experience, mm -hmm. you go, you're in pain, you feel a little discomfort, and then in a day or so, it's like, wow, I'm starting, that feels, I feel a little better, you know? And right. You keep right. going, and it's, it just, it's progressive, and it, it uh, you know, in, in, in many cases, it seems to resolve pretty progressively over time. Exactly, and that's the natural history of most episodes of back pain is that they're, they're self-limited, right? They, they get better, yeah. they get better on their own, or with a little bit of help from therapy, a little bit of help from, sure. from medications. Sure. We're gonna get into that. Now let's talk in our next slide, we talk about the team approach to care. And you mentioned some of the members of the team. Let's go through, you know, here we see a physiatrist, which is another name for what you do. That's correct. That's another name for your PM&R specialty, right? right? Which is physical medicine and, and rehabilitation. So a huge specialty. It covers a lot of different other specialties. So we do a little bit of neurology, a little bit of orthopedics, non-operative. Now we're, we're a non-operative specialty. Right. Um, some, some focus on um, spinal cord injuries or brain injury patients. There's just such a broad spectrum of it. And back pain is one of those, those sub categories, I guess okay. you would say. We talked about neurosurgeons, and, and we're going to get into that in our, in our next uh, program with Dr. Hayes. Uh, surgical residents, you know, a large part of what very large systems do is, and, and the simple fact is, is that we have to continue to train physicians, right? Sure, right. Because we, we need more and more of them, mm -hmm. and uh, there's only one way to train them, and that's just boots on the ground in front of the patient with a, Absolutely. With a skilled physician. That's exactly right. So registered nurses, you really have a good comprehensive mix of people here. Nurses are probably doing some medical assessments to back, back up and to speed you up a bit. That's right, that's right. So. Uh, what, what is an advanced nurse practitioner? We see that on the screen. Right, so nurse practitioners and sometimes uh, physician's assistants also can help with assessing patients. I know that uh, Dr. Vu has a very good uh, physician's assistant in his office, and uh, I'm currently not working with one, so I'm solo, but yeah, I have a good nurse. <laughs> <laughs> very good, very good. Physical therapists, we talked about that. They're, they're a critical part of the team. Absolutely. Uh, we have two other uh, specialists on this slide, not necessarily uh, a part of the model that, that we're familiar with in Slidell, right? Right, but for a general rehabilitation program, they're definitely essential. Occupational therapists do good work, and of course social workers get patients integrated back into society. So. Yeah. Yeah, and sometimes absolutely. help them find resources and, exactly. and uh, you know, post-stroke patients with occupational therapy, criti critical components, but not so much with back and spine right now because it's, it's, we, we really want to focus down into those areas in the clinic. Exactly. Yeah. So in our next slide, we talk about goals of the program. Why don't you take us through those? Right. So it, again, these are kind of general rules for, for treating patients in the rehabilitation setting and you want to improve their overall health. And so that's going back to that comprehensive assessment where we're I'm looking at not only things that affect their back, but I'm looking at the other medications. Are they diabetic? Is their blood sugar out of control? Because if we want to give them steroids or, you know, for interventional pain, we've got to make sure those things are under control. Um, restore functional uh, ability. That's always a goal for, for us. Um, reducing pain in this setting is the primary goal. That's what the patient is there for. And it, and by reducing the pain, we're going to en enhance the patient's 
quality of life and hopefully allow them to get back into some of the things they want to want to do. Absolutely. All right. So we talked about that. Now, one of the uh, key diagnoses or one of the maybe more prevalent diagnoses that you see is lower back pain. Yes. And when, when I was doing some research and working with you on this presentation, it was, I was astounded to read that you know, almost 80% of Americans will have, quote unquote, back pain right. during their lives. Back pain is common. Why is that? Why is back pain common? That's a good question. Um, weekend warriors? Weekend warriors is some, but also it's gravity over time, right? So it's effects, a lot of it is effects of aging and how it wears on the spine over time, like any structure sure. over time kind of wears out. We're not designed to, to, li to, 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 be, uh, to live forever, right? That's exactly and right. So uh, the parts pa wear out. The parts start to wear out. And parts wear out at different speeds, right? Some That's people right. wear out earlier. Sometimes you'll see someone with advanced disease or an advanced condition in, in their 30s and then sometimes you'll see someone in their 70s whose spine looks really good. So. Right. And so it, it doesn't always correlate with age spe specificity. It, That's right. It, it could, you know, and uh, there's probably some, uh, there could also be trauma, that right? That, That's that, right. That has a big impact on this. Absolutely. And so when you have lower back pain, it's called lumbar? That's the lumbar? That's right. That's the lumbar region. So you have a cervical region that's in the neck. Thoracic region is kind of in the middle where your rib cage is. And then the lumbar is the lower, the lower back. Yeah. And I guess when a lot of people think of the spine, you know, you, you think of, you know, Mr. Skeleton, which is uh, pretty much bones, right? right. Yeah. But there's a lot more going on there. Yeah, you there's know. a lot more muscles and... And the discs and the ligaments and, and all those things and tendons. Yeah. And all of those things can be sources of, of pain. You know, so, but they're all treated in relatively the same way. You know, a little bit of time, some little bit of medication, and a little bit of therapy. Right. Most of the time. Right. Take us through. There's a there's a really great diagram on your slide. Yeah. And uh, take us through quickly those different types of discs and dis the disc disorders that you see going down there. Right. The commonest things. First of all, you got to look at the the spinal unit. You have a bone right, a vertebral body, and then you have a disc that's sandwiched between those two bones that kind of acts as a cushion or a shock absorber between. And it's made like a jelly donut kind of. It's got a tuff on the outside, but it's kind of got a gel in the, in the middle of it. Um, and then you have joints in the back called facet joints that also help to bear weight. So one of the common conditions is just degeneration of the disc that happens over over time and the discs start to dry out, they become more fragile, they can get little tears in them and then they can rupture or herniate where the gel that's inside the disc can protrude out and it's got all kinds of inflammatory chemicals and those things can irritate nerve roots and other structures, give you pinched nerve symptoms and, and all kinds of things like like that. Another common thing is just arthritis in the in the joints in your back and that all goes along. That's part of the degenerative pathway. So arthritis in the spine is a disc related issue? Indirectly. Yeah. I mean, as the, because because the, the the bones begin to get affected, right? Well the the, the, the vertebra? Well, the discs, the discs start to wear out, and when the discs start to wear out, it puts pressure on the joints, I see. and then the pressure on the joints over time causes them to, to develop arthritis, yes. Okay. Yeah. So in our next slide, we talk about different types of back pain. There's no one back pain, right? There's That's lots right. of different. Everybody's different. Yeah. Everybody experiences pain differently, yes. Sure. So talk, talk, tell us about acute pain now. Yeah, acute pain is, means it just happened. Okay, it's, a new, it's new pain. It doesn't necessarily mean it's the first time you've ever had, but this episode of pain is new. And when, by new, I mean less than three months old is the general rule. And um, the, you manage that basically with anti-inflammatory medications and then sometimes with physical therapy, sometimes with oral steroids. Um, muscle relaxers, short term, um, heat, ice, whatever it takes to get you, to get you through. And then when you get into the chronic phase, that's beyond 
that's beyond three months. And you still continue a lot of the same treatments that just progressed into another, another phase. That's when you might start thinking about interventional pain management. About, you know, about going into the uh, spinal column, is that correct to say the spinal column? Right, the... so, exactly. There, there are different approaches that you can use for interventional pain. Some of it addresses the joints, um, some of it addresses nerve roots, and there are several different ways that you can do. All right. So we talk about now, you, you have opportunities now. You know, medicine is, has become so advanced, has become so sophisticated, uh, computerized, and uh, you know, with the electronic medical record. Now we have yep. images, you know, flying around, um, you know, to computer to computer, which is a wonderful thing because you can have your image, you can have your radiologist read it, they can put it in the, the archive, and then they can send it over to you. Exactly. And we're, we're talking, you know, hours now. We used to take days. Exactly. One of the few good things about the medical record, the electronic <laughs> medical record, <laughs> that you can get images anytime you want it, you know, yeah, so yeah. That, that makes it easy. Yeah, EM, EMR is a, a kind of a mixed bag. Yeah, yes, it is. That's so it is. on this slide, we see two different types of tests, Yes. Uh, x-rays and MRIs. Tell us what is the progression or when do you use one as opposed to the other? Okay, um, x-ray is a good screening, a good screening uh, examination. Uh, it shows just bone and some soft tissue shadows, but you can't really see soft tissue in detail with, uh, with x-rays. So it's good for showing you discs that are degenerated, but you can't make a determination whether there's a disc herniation there or any other, or a tear in the disc or any involvement of nerve roots. You can't make a determination of that off of an x-ray. Is an x-ray where you would determine arthritis in the spine? You can, and, and then MRI will also help you determine that as as well, but yes, arthritis would, or fractures, it's good for ruling uh, out. Traumatic. For screening for, yes. for fractures too. Okay. Yes. And then MRI is going to give you a whole lot more detail. You're going to not only see the bony structures, but you're also going to, to see in more detail the arthritis like you were talking about. You'll be able to see the spinal cord, the spinal fluid, the individual nerve roots, the disc, and the complete disc structure. Um, so it's almost too much detail. Yeah. Yeah. So is the, uh, so what's the, what's the go-to to, to assist you in your, in your assessment. Right, so it's kind of, it's difficult to say because you don't there's always no, need. There's no one answer, right? That's right, you don't always need to have any imaging, right? So you can treat someone with back pain without any imaging at all, especially in the early, the early part of their treatment, just based off of their clinical presentation. And, you know, we like to think we're skilled enough to determine who needs to be imaged sooner than that. That so. is a that is a critical point that you made and one of the one of the key reasons that we see the effectiveness of the back and spine center is that we're we're trying in healthcare to find the most uh, cost effective appropriate outcome for the patient. Exactly. And what we've seen in, in in the studies of back and spine centers and especially ones that you've been affiliated with is that we are able to reduce the cost of care for that patient by maybe avoiding some tests that don't need to be done at that time. Exactly, exactly. So we get uh, these expensive imaging studies done when they don't really add anything to the, to the treatment. So, and a lot of that is physician driven and some of that is patient expectations because you know, as technology advances, patients come to expect those imaging studies, and if you don't do them, they're kind of looking at you like you're crazy, and really it's just because it's not necessary. Because most of the causes of back pain are benign, right? They're, they're harmless. They hurt, but they're not bad, right? right. It's not cancer, it's not infection, it's, it's not anything that's going to paralyze you. So we're talking about reprogramming the, the, the theory of uh, what does it take to actually do diagnosis. Exactly. Let's move into our next slide where we talk about treatment. You had mentioned earlier, anti-inflammatories, some of those are over the counter, yes. many of them are right. today. Right. Um, you talk about physical therapy as a treatment, very important. Physical therapy is hugely important. People have to realize also that time 
is uh, exactly. it, it's actually uh, the, one of the components of the healing process. That's right, you've got you've got to heal. So long before there were doctors around, people got hurt, and a lot of them just got better on their on their own. But we can kind of help you along. Yeah, well, <laughs> shorten shorten the pain cycle, exactly. minimize the you know minimize the pain cycle. Right. Uh, one of the things you know we we talked about you know maybe some muscle relaxants in in you know cases where you got these muscles just tightening up and they won't, you know, you need something to loosen them up. Short term. Short term stuff. And then nerve pain, we, that's a whole show that we're going to come back and do. So hold, okay. Okay. let's not talk hold about that today. On that. Okay. But uh, a very contemporary topic right now, narcotic medications. And you right. say you rarely want to use those. You, they're rarely needed. And, and a lot of times they're not even effective for for especially for nerve type of, of pain, but you want to avoid them obviously because of the, the problems with dependence on on those and the, unfortunately some people are misusing those medications in the in the community. But mostly we don't want to create another monster. You've already got one monster you're trying to deal with. If I then turn you into an addict, then right. I've made another monster. And, and that's so what we, we try to avoid. We've learned over the past oh, several decades, at least a couple of decades, mm -hmm. that the narcotics uh, are very useful, but their use has to be extremely limited. Very limited use, yes. So in our in one of our final slides here, we talk about the success stories. And, and I know you have to be very proud of the work of you and your team, because what you are seeing and what, what I've read about your program is improved outcomes and decreased cost. Why That's, is that important? Well, you always want to have improved outcomes. And they kind of tie in together when the patient gets better sooner then the costs are go down you're not having that extra cost of unnecessary imaging and, and things like that or unnecessary interventions and evaluation so those things tie in tie in together and your program has demonstrated these values so I want to, uh, in our final slide we say for more information there's a way to contact uh, Dr. Braxton you can go to auctioner.org to schedule an appointment. They have a very slick uh, system there where you can pick an appointment time and you can see what's available and you do all of that on your computer or on, on your mobile device. Or you can go uh, the old fashioned way and call them at 985-875-2727. Dr. Braxton, it's been a, a pleasure to speak to you today. Thank you for sharing your knowledge about this very important program. From all of us at HealthQuest, we thank you so much for joining us today. Have a healthy day.